resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Davenport. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. It's an absolute pleasure for me to stand in this House on behalf of the residents of Davenport, a riding I'm very proud to represent to speak on uh, Bill C-74. If we look at Budget 2018, it continues what we've tried to do uh, once we were elected uh, in late 2015 and our first budget 2016 and 2017, which is about how is it that we continue to support Canadians, their family, our youth and our seniors, and how is it that we can continue to set up both Canada and Canadians for success and to prosper moving forward. That's really, if I had to sort of summarize it, that's really what we're trying to do with, with this budget. And again, it's a continuation of what we've already been trying to do. I'm going to focus my comments over the next few minutes on areas where I think that Budget 2018 is of particular benefit uh, to Davenport. And I'm going to start with something that's a bit top of mind for me right now, which is the area of uh, the skills and the jobs of today and tomorrow. Um, I recently attended the Public Policy Forum, and Mark Carney was uh, one of the honorees there. And he talked about uh, a few things. He said, in any large period of technological change, uh, it mercilessly destroys jobs and livelihoods, and therefore identities. And he also referenced a number of surveys where he said that more than 90% of people don't think their jobs will be affected by automation, while CEOs expect the exact opposite. And then he also further said that everybody will be going back to school um, and clearly there's a need uh, to not only go back for lifelong learning but also to relook at our social welfare system on how is that we're going to support our population moving forward. And I say all of this, uh, Mr. Speaker, because in uh, 2015 in one of the debates during the election, 17-year-old uh, at JJP Chinini asked me the question, how is it that government's going to protect him and ensure that he has jobs because robots are taking over the jobs that he wants to do? And my response was that uh, government, that the world is changing faster than ever before, but we have a chance to actually chart our future. And I want people to know that our government uh, is very seized with this issue. Last year, we put a significant amount of money in Budget 2017 around skills and training and putting far more flexibility in our social welfare system to allow people to train uh, and do all we can to encourage them to go into lifelong learning, whether they want to do part-time studies, whether they're on EI and, and want to do some retraining, whether they're in mid-career and want to completely change careers. We've put in a whole, whole bunch of, uh, of, uh, of uh, programs. And in this, uh, this year, in Budget 2018, we continue on this track. Um, so we have made a historic investment of, ne of nearly $4 billion over five years to support the next generation of Canadian researchers. So what we're trying to do is invest in what are some of the areas where there's going to be future jobs? How is it that we can invest in areas that are going to create some of those future jobs, create some of those investments, encourage some of those innovations? So that's $4 billion uh, over, the, um, over the next five years to support the next generation of Canadian researchers, uh, $1.2 billion over five years for Canada's granting councils and research chairs, in, in addition to additional dollars for laboratories, equipment, and infrastructure that researchers rely on every, uh, every day. We've put in quite a bit of money to support our colleges uh, as well, Mr. Speaker, and I'm delighted to see that they very much are the ones that are part of the forefront to creating some of those programs that allow uh, Canadian workers to transition. Uh, we've put in quite a bit of money, uh, $2.6 billion um, uh, around entrepreneurship. We want to make it easier for Canadians to do business and for entrepreneurs to more easily access the resources they need to innovate, scale up and create jobs as well as reach customers around the world. And I'll just mention a couple other things. Uh, you know, we are spending some additional dollars, almost $2 billion for, to support women-owned businesses, which I think is absolutely uh, wonderful. And, and finally, just a whole bunch of programs that's going to really help uh, companies uh, innovate and actually help them to expand right across this country and around the world. So very, very proud of that. Uh, I then want to move on to uh, a next section, which is uh, was one of the top of the list in my pre-budget consultation for 2018 in Davenport, where fundamentally everybody and people who came out uh, let me know that Canada can't achieve its potential 50% of the population is held back. And as you know, Mr. Speaker, we've put in quite a bit of money around uh, how is it that we can make sure that women have uh, an equal opportunity to succeed in whatever areas they want to um, uh, 
uh, moving forward. Uh, so government's putting gender at the heart of its decision making, working to help w support women and girls, reduce the gender wage gap, increase the participation of women in the workforce, which helps boost economic growth for all uh, Canadians. And so um, in terms of just specific things that we're doing, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure you've heard this many times before, but we're very proud of it. And, and it's a uh, high time that we've put in some significant money into these areas. Um, we are uh, putting in, we're finally introducing our um, uh, gender wage gap legislation. It'll be introduced this fall. I was part of that committee. We named that report Action Now because we knew it's, it's a long time coming. And finally, at the federal level, we will ensure that we will have um, uh, pay equity uh, at the national level. Uh, we're also putting quite a bit of money into... Um, uh, helping women enter the trades and succeed in the trades. So uh, uh, $20 million over five years for an apprenticeship incentive grant for women. I think what we're doing is seeing how successful it is and if we need to put some more money moving forward. And uh, again, there's a whole bunch of other initiatives uh, that we're doing around women and the workforce. And I mentioned before the entrepreneurship, uh, really encourage more women to sort of uh, support them during uh, when they're starting up businesses and as they're, they're trying to build their businesses moving forward. Um, oh, and I should mention, this is another thing, and I know that I've had a number of parents say this, that this is a point of pride for them, which is the Employment Insurance Parental Sharing Benefit. It allows up to eight additional weeks if, if both partners uh, raising children uh, decide to actually take uh, a parental leave. And it actually allows a woman uh, who has traditionally held uh, more or taken more of the parental leave, it allows a woman to go back into the workforce much more quickly. So very, very proud of that, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, the next uh, uh, part I want to talk about in terms of what I'm proud of in our budget is the government proposes to provide $23 million over two years, uh, starting this year, to increase funding for multiculturalism uh, programming administered by uh, Canadian culture, sorry, Canadian heritage. Um, and, you know, the budget says this funding would support cross-country consultations on a new national anti-racism approach, would bring together experts, community organizations, citizens, citizens, interfaith leaders, to find ways to collaborate and combat discrimination, and would dedicate increased funds to address racism and discrimination targeted towards a number of minority groups that we've identified in the budget. You know, I was at the local mosque uh, a couple of weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, and uh, uh, one of the congregate congregants came up to me and he said, Julie, I'm having a hard time finding a job and I'm fairly convinced it's because of my name and it's not because of my qualifications and so what I said to him is that we have some money allocated in budget 2018 around anti-racism and systemic discrimination and I committed to him that what I would do is actually hold something in our riding around employers and around minority groups that felt that they were being there was some sort of uh, systemic discrimination or some sort of uh, 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 bias uh, that is not seen within the system and that's something that we could study together and come up with some solutions. Um, so very, very proud uh, that we actually have that uh, in our budget. I also see this uh, as a way of promoting our multiculturalism. 52% of Downport Riding uh, were, uh, residents were born outside of Canada. I have a huge uh, Portuguese, Italian, Hispanic, Brazilian uh, population. Uh, very proud of them, and I think that they'll be very happy uh, to know that this funding uh, exists. I'll mention a few other final uh, areas. I know I only have uh, two minutes to speak, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, but, I, you know, Davenport has, uh, is very proud of their environmentalism, uh, and they're very proud of our federal government's uh, um, commitment to uh, achieving the Paris Accord uh, targets and to fighting climate change. And I'm very, very proud that in this budget, we have committed $1.3 billion over five years to protect Canada's ecosystems, our landscapes, our biodiversity and species at risk. We love our nature. We're so blessed in this country that we have such a beautiful country with lots of uh, parks, uh, lots of uh, lakes, lots of natural beauty. And, I, and, and to me, I'm very proud that I'm part of a government that wants to protect it for, for today and for generations to come. Um, as well as just very quickly, we've put some money in to make sure that uh, we support the federal carbon pollution pricing system. I know I'm in my last minute, Mr. Speaker, so I'll just mention a few other things that I think are really helpful for Davenport residents. Small businesses have told me that they're elated the fact that we are decreasing small business taxes from 11% to 9%. They're absolutely delighted, particularly seniors have come up to me. They said they're very happy that we're, we're, uh, we're very serious about national pharmacare, that we are, it, we've created an advisory committee to look at how we're going to implement it, not trying to decide 
whether we want to move uh, ahead with it, but we're trying to decide what's the best way to implement it across Canada. Um, and I know I have to just mention, very happy with the dollars around border security and no-fly list, the support for local journalism, the cybersecurity support, as well as the support for uh, Indigenous people. I just want to say thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Ten minutes has gone by so quickly, but thanks for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the residents of Davenport, and I welcome any questions. Thank you. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for uh, well, Oshawa. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my Liberal colleague for her speech. But I've, I've been listening to a lot of Liberal speeches, and I'm trying to get my head around it because Liberals are only talking about the extra money they're spending. Uh, there's nothing that they're talking about that helps the Canadians who actually pay the bills. It's very clear that the PM has this war against our traditional Canadian strengths. He made it clear this week when he reiterated in Europe that he wants to commit to phasing out our fossil fuels. He said during the election he wants to transition away from manufacturing. He's killed capital intense industries like mining because of his regulatory and tax policies. He's regulating our fisheries. He's refusing to negotiate and end the softwood lumber dispute. So all of these things were traditionally Canada's strengths. And this Prime Minister and his policies are actually De decreasing the amount of competitiveness in these industries and their ability to make money to pay for these things. So my question to my colleague is, which industries and which uh, Canadian strength companies are going to be left to pay for all these incredibly costly expenses that the Liberals are talking about? The Honourable Member for Davenport. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and, I'll, uh, and I thank the Honourable Member for his question. As I mentioned at the beginning of my, uh, my 10-minute speech, uh, what we're trying to do very much is prepare the way for Canada and Canadians uh, to actually prosper and succeed moving forward. Uh, so to me, we're strengthening Canadians, so we've actually reduced income taxes as well. It, it's one of our first acts uh, of government. We are trying to do everything we can to actually remain competitive. So I mentioned the fact that for small businesses, we've actually reduced their income taxes from 11% to 9%. That really helps us. We have also uh, invested very heavily in a number of industries, uh, and we call it super clusters. And it's a way for us to say, these are industries that we think not only we're leaders here in Canada, but we can absolutely be leaders in the world. And so we're putting additional dollars at the federal level to leverage the dollars that are already there in order for us to be able to be global leaders and competitors for years to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Similkameen Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate the Member's comments and contributions to the debate today on the Budget Implementation Act. During the election, Liberals actually talked about working with provinces on uh, creating a pan-Canadian uh, climate change and actually said we won't use the, uh, the stick, Mr. Speaker, to work with provinces. We'll give them carrots. Now we find out in this budget bill, 200 pages of it is a nationally imposed carbon tax. We have not been able to get information from uh, the Minister's office as to the uh, policy rationale, including figures that would show what the average family would pay under this. Mr. Speaker, this place is here, is dedicated towards making sure there is not taxation without representation. Does the member agree that this lack of transparency inhibits the ability of members of Parliament, including herself, from being able to accurately decide whether or not that this tax is fair to the people of Canada? That information is funded by Canadian tax dollars and I believe should be presented to decision makers in this place. Does she agree with this lack of transparency? The Honourable Member for Davenport. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Um, the federal government is absolutely serious about and committed to achieving our Paris Accord uh, targets. Uh, so we're, we are absolutely committed. We made that very clear. We are going to be uh, leaders uh, and uh, collaborators uh, in terms of fighting climate change. And it will take all the provinces and territories and municipalities to work with us to be able to do that. We came together uh, over a year ago. We signed a pan-Canadian uh, framework. We all agreed that we want to achieve the Paris, Accord, uh, Paris uh, Accord targets and that we all have a role to play. Uh, I think Canadians expect this leadership at the national level. It is what we're trying to do. We've put some money uh, around carbon pricing, uh, and we are working individually with each of the provinces to be able to, to achieve those targets and be on track uh, and do our part to fight climate change. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. 
We have uh, time for uh, just a short question and response. Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my colleague, the Member of Parliament from, from Davenport, was on the Pay Equity Task Force that was initiated uh, as a result of the NDP motion in 2016. Uh, the government, very sadly, has delayed implementation again, 42 years later, of pay equity legislation. It's not in this budget. It will come when we now hear in the fall. Were there any witnesses that the member heard and the Pay Equity Task Force that actually recommended uh, such a long delay? Because that's not what I've heard. The Honourable Member for Davenport. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Honourable Member for a question. And I want to thank the, the, uh, the, uh, ND, my NDP colleagues for their leadership in pushing for this pay equity legislation at the national level. Um, it's, uh, I would have wanted all of this done yesterday. What we did here on the committee, if I recall correctly, is this last bit, bit of uh, pay, pay equity equalization that we need to do is, is complicated. There's categories, uh, there's, there's a lot of complexity around different pay structures that's within the government. So we knew it would take a little bit of time, but we want to make sure that we're doing it right. And I think the story actually is, Mr. Speaker, not you know, that it's taken so long for us to get there, but the story finally is that we are going to get this done. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. You're here. Resuming.